We've been looking at some I am statements that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John. Very revealing about how Christ wants us to perceive him. He desires for us to see him as a water that if we drink of what he offers that we'll never be thirsty again. And so he told the woman at the well that if she did that, she would never thirst. We also have seen him present himself as the bread of life. And he says, if you take nourishment from me, you'll never be lacking as long as you live. He's also let us know that he's the light and that as light, he completely understands our struggle with darkness. And so he's able to illuminate not just our way, but he's able to bring us back into the light by the cleansing of his blood. So Jesus is the light. And last uh, time that we studied this, we talked about Jesus being the door. And I compared door being the place of home. And so Jesus is the place of our peaceful, perfect home. So those are the, the I am's that we have looked at thus far. Today we're going to look, obviously, at Jesus as the good shepherd. As the good shepherd. I'm going to begin with some sheep reality. Sheep are the most domesticated animal on the face of the earth. It's estimated that there are over 10,000 different breeds of sheep. That blew my mind, but that's what I read. 10,000 different breeds of sheep. When a sheep falls down, they call it cast. When a sheep falls down, he's unable to return to his feet and so needs help actually to, to right himself. They are so domesticated that they have become human reliant. They cannot shed their wool. Now, when there were wild animals, that's how wild sheep still do. Uh, when they're not domesticated, they just shed their wool. Domesticated sheep cannot. And that's why you can get online and read about, I think there was one that was named Barak. Uh, there was another one. I think the, the sheep that got lost and ended up with the weightiest amount of wool to be sheared, I think his name was Chris, and they shaved off 85 pounds of wool once they found him. So a, a sheep's unable to get, to get rid of that on their own when they are domesticated. And obviously they have no natural defenses. They don't have, as a matter of fact, they don't have top teeth. They only have bottom teeth. Uh, so they can't bite. All of these factors about a domesticated sheep show how dependent a sheep is on humans. There is a special relationship between sheep and human being. A few weeks ago, as we were talking about home, I showed you some pictures of Fedora and referenced a chicken coop that was also a garage that was also where Fosse was brought in to be milked. Well, I, I didn't mention that Grandpa also had two sheep. And Grandpa would, would breed his milk cow, and then he would always butcher veal. And he did that himself, and it was just like a regular thing. But he had two sheep, and he had relationship with those two sheep. He actually gave them names. The milk cow was Fosse, which I think he called every cow anyhow. But he, he gave the sheep names. And not only did he give them names, he named them after his two granddaughters. One was Bobby Jo, my sister, and the other was Colleen. Leany is what we called her. The other was Leany. And so he had these two sheep, Bobby Jo and Leany. And it never made sense to me why we weren't butchering sheep. You know, he would do this, this calf, but why not, why not the sheep? And I remember, I, and I don't know why he made the decision to finally do that, but I remember how sad he was to butcher those two sheep. Why? Relationship. Sheep are dependent. Sheep are dependent. They're also pretty defenseless. I mentioned that already. Job, in, in the book of Job, talks about his his great sheepdog. There is a, a great Pyrenees that is a protector of sheep. It's a very independent animal. Does not make the best pet because it likes to be alone. And what this dog will actually do is will sit down somewhat distant from the sheep and all he does is listens. And if he hears anything, he charges it. He attacks. It doesn't do anything with the sheep. He's after whatever it is that he thinks might be a danger. There was also a border collie. Uh, there, there's 
uh, Australian sheepdogs, there's all different kinds. But the border collie is really kind of unusual because the border collie doesn't really bark, doesn't really nip at the, at the animals. The border collie does it with his eyes. It's actually called, it's called the eye. The border collie will give the sheep the eye. Shepherds can send a border collie two miles away to gather herds of sheep. And here is a close-up of the eye. And that's what they will do. They will stare at the sheep. And basically they're saying, I'm the boss of you. And you need to get on the move now. And the sheep will move. So sheep are also very emotional creatures. Those who have studied them say that they have different facial expressions uh, that, that will show fear or anger or peacefulness or joy, uh, and also that their ears become indicators of their emotional moods. They are highly independent from birth, don't really need anything, yet the unusual thing is they also love being in a group. They're also very much a sheep people. They have impressive memories. But they, they have found out that sheep can remember other sheep up to 50 for longer than two years. So they have a memory of one another. And this one was really interesting. They have a rectangular pupil. So their peripheral vision can be up to 320 degrees. That compares with us as humans at 155. So do you ever want to know why it was hard to sneak up on a sheep? Because they're seeing way back here. And they're also unusually able to medicate themselves. If they have a certain ailment, they know that there are certain plants that will benefit them. And they will actually seek that out to medicate themselves. Okay, so let's, let's just make some comparison. I am the good shepherd. We need his divine touch. We need his divine touch. We cannot get up from our fallen state. We can't resurrect ourselves from our fallenness. We cannot shed our suff suffocating coat of sin. It has to be cut off. It has to be sheared by the shepherd. We have no natural defenses against the evil one. On our own, we are, we are bait. We are prey. But with Jesus, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, the Hebrew writer will say. We are emotionally charged people, every one of us. We struggle with being slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to anger. We struggle with that because we're emotional people. Jesus, as shepherd, knows we are emotional people. We tend to be enticed by too much of what we see. We see too much. Our peripheral vision is too good, and we long for things that we really don't need to long for. And how many of us have attempted to self-heal? Instead of depending upon the blood of Jesus, we've tried to fix ourselves. Uh, stronger willpower, more determination, rather than more dependence, rather than more willingness to obey. I want to just lay out very quickly the progression of shepherding. It's fascinating to look at scripture and to see how this whole process began. For example, the first shepherd is God himself. God himself. We read this in Genesis chapter 48. And this is as, uh, uh, as Israel is giving blessings to uh, Joseph's son. <clears throat> and he says, Then he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life. Recognition of the shepherding work of God himself. Initially, the first shepherd is God. Then what we find is that God, when he selected his people and began to be the God of the nation, that he wanted there to be leaders who would have shepherd hearts, who would oversee his people. And they would feel towards his people like he felt towards his people. What we find out, though, is that most of those shepherds fell very short from having God's kind of shepherding heart. We find over and over in Jeremiah and Ezekiel a uh, pronouncement of the selfishness that was driving these shepherds, 
uh, their own selfish desire. And here in Isaiah, some very strong language, again, showing that the negative way that these shepherds had gone. These dogs have fierce appetites. They never have enough. They are shepherds who have no discernment. All of them turn to their own way, every last one for his own gain. So God says, I was the original shepherd. I tried to pick some people that were going to have my kind of heart to shepherd my, my, my people Israel. But it didn't work. It didn't work. They didn't have my heart. They became selfish. So even within the Old Testament time, God begins to promise a new shepherd. If you were with us when we went through our Isaiah survey, uh, one of the lessons that uh, our brother brought out in that video was the promise of shepherd throughout the book of Isaiah, the coming shepherd, the coming shepherd. Here is uh, one of those texts. Zion, herald of good news, go up on a, on a high mountain. Jerusalem, herald the good news, raise your voice loudly, raise it, do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with strength, and his power establishes his rule. His reward is with him, and his gifts accompany him. He protects his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. There's the promise of a new shepherd, of a shepherd who is going to have the heart of God. And we recognize that that was Jesus Christ. But then we find after Christ ascends into heaven, again, the plan is for God's kingdom, God's kingdom to have leaders, elders over it that serve with shepherd hearts. And so we read of Paul's relationship to the elders at Ephesus. Be on guard for yourselves and over the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has anointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that my, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And men from among yourselves will rise up with defiant doctrines and lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on alert, remembering that night and day for three years I did not stop warning each of you with tears. So here's the way we would diagram this out. The very first shepherd is God himself. He selects people to govern over, watch over his flock Israel. They were very neglectful in that responsibility. So he promises, I'm going to send another shepherd. And he's going to be the shepherd of all shepherds. And he's going to come with strength and might and power. And so Zion needs to be shouting, this, looking forward to this promise. And then after Jesus leaves, elders are, are put in with shepherd hearts to watch over the church. What we're talking about today is this guy, the shepherd of shepherds, Jesus. I am the good shepherd. So as we think about Jesus' role as shepherd, I, I got interested in finding out that the Bible has three different modifiers to Jesus as shepherd. And we find the first in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So the Hebrew writer refers to Jesus as the great shepherd. The great shepherd. Megan Poimena. Megan kind of sounds like what? Mega. Powerful. It means great. External form is great. It means the measure and the height is great. It means the quality is great. It means the age is great. Jesus is the great shepherd. His external form as God in the flesh makes him what? <laughs> A great shepherd. Great shepherd. The measure and the height of Jesus, his sinlessness, his perfection, makes him the great shepherd. His quality makes him the great shepherd. His age. <laughs> you know, in the, in, in the New Testament, the term elder is applied to those who God wants to shepherd over his kingdom now, implying age. That's what the word elder implies. It implies some age. Who has more age than Jesus? He is 
the chief shepherd. He is the chief. He is the chief. It has to do with rank, authority, virtue, and ability, and importance. And it also has to do with just what is splendid and grand and stately. Jesus is the great shepherd. But then we also have in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. In verse 1, Peter says, I exhort the elders among you, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseen out of compulsion, but freely according to God's will, not for money, but eagerly not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So we've got the Hebrew writer saying Jesus is the chief shepherd, the, the great shepherd. And we've got Peter saying Jesus is the chief shepherd. Archie Poimain, it's the only place it appears in the whole Bible is right there. It is obviously a conjoined word from Arche, which means chief, in order, time, place, and rank, and poimain, which means shepherd. So he is called the chief shepherd. It establishes the subordinate shepherds under him. In other words, back to our diagram, God to the shepherds of Israel, to the shepherd of all shepherds, and to the shepherd hearts that watch over the, the, the spiritual church with the shepherd heart. Jesus is the shepherd. Everyone else is subordinate to him. It shows his dignity and his glory. It sets him up as the perfect example. It points to his heavenly majesty. Then the passage that we are looking at in John chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired man, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired man and doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. As the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. In English, we, <clears throat> we have the word good that actually is used to translate two different Greek words. And the first one is agathos, which means good in any sense. It is a goodness that is seen by others. It produces specific benefit for others and transfers benefits to others. Richardson in his word study says it is ethical goodness. The second word is the word kalos, and it means precious because of one's own beauty and decency. It has to do, according to Richardson, with aesthetic beauty. So we have the one that is good in the sense of bringing goodness into the life of others, and the other that is good in the sense of their own beauty. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Which of those do you think he uses? He uses this one. Jesus does not say, I am the good shepherd in the sense that I'm here to give you a benefit. He does give us a benefit. But he says, I am the beautiful shepherd. I am good. Keep that tucked away because we'll come back. The beauty of shepherd Jesus is witnessed in a number of facts in this text. One, it's witnessed in the fact that he has received us as a gift from God. He says this in verse 29, my father who has given them to me, talking about sheep, is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. Look at what happens here. When you and I come through the blood of Christ to become adopted children of God, we are gods. What Jesus says is that God then in turn does what? He gives us to Jesus. He gives us to Jesus. We get right with God because of Jesus' righteousness, and then God turns around and gives us back to Jesus. Now that, that just ought to do something in your heart when you stop to think about Jesus being your mediator, Jesus being the man that is between you and God. That ought to do something in here to think that God accepts us back, 
pure in the blood of Jesus, and then gives us right back to Jesus. And Jesus says, the Father has given you to me, and nobody's going to take you away. You're mine. He knows you completely. As shepherd, as a beautiful shepherd, Jesus knows us completely. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Jesus knows every wrinkle in your Christian life, but he's still your shepherd because he's good, because he's beautiful. So much does he care for us that he sacrificed himself. Again, he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. That's my goodness. He will never abandon you. Verses 12 through 14, the hired man, since he is not the shepherd, he doesn't own the sheep. He leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. And then the wolf then snatches the sheep away. This happens because he's a hired man. He doesn't care about the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Jesus doesn't abandon us. He's always there. And he gives us eternal life. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And then he promises that we will never perish I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That's a good shepherd. But life gets rough. Life gets hard. Situations arise that we never thought would ever come into our lives. And we are sheep, and we look to our shepherd. We say, why did you take me down this path? What's all this about? I think this is why when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He did not use the word in Greek that means I have a benefit for you. I'm good and there's a goodness that I can give to you. I think this is the reason he said, I am beautiful. I am good. When life gets hard, it becomes very difficult to trust the shepherd, to let the shepherd direct, to allow him the control of our life, to follow him, becomes really difficult. When life gets difficult, it's tough to listen to the shepherd's voice. When life gets difficult, it becomes arduous to wait on the shepherd. And it becomes really problematic to have a spirit of gratitude. And you know, I think there are multitudes of people who once were in the flock of Jesus, who choose not to be in the flock of Jesus any longer because life got hard And they couldn't justify a good shepherd allowing them to have that kind of difficulty in their life. And it was easier to reject the shepherd than to try to figure out how he is a good shepherd allowing this to happen to me. And I think if you process that some, you will be able to identify multitudes of people that you know who found it easier to desert the flock than to try to come to to grips with the fact that Jesus is still my good shepherd. Hindus and and, uh, Buddhists commonly make use of what's called a, a mantra. And it is a word or a sound that's repeated to aid them in concentration. I was speaking with Becky this morning trying to remember which of our grandchildren, and I think it's our youngest grandson, Bo. And it seemed like it would just be spontaneous at the most appropriate times, and it would break us, just crack everybody up. But something would happen, and he would go, hum. Hum, hum. Well, that's kind of what a mantra is. A noise that brings you to a place of clearer meditation. Here's a Christian mantra. If you're following our reading schedule, a couple of things. Number one, I want you to pay attention to Numbers chapter 16 and look at what complaining did there. And secondly, that goes back a couple weeks. And secondly, you're going to be reading the 23rd Psalm. And this would be worth writing down at the location of the 23rd Psalm in your Bible. Here's a mantra for my life when things get hard. Here's a mantra when it's difficult to trust the shepherd as being good, when good doesn't seem to be happening. Jesus is my good shepherd, and I can trust him. Jesus is my good shepherd, and I can trust him. Jesus is my good shepherd. 
I can trust him. Not because he's promised to bring goodness into my life as I define goodness, but because he, as a standalone, as an I am, Jehovah, God, is good. He is good. I can trust that. Let's just try that so that we maybe remember. Are you ready? Jesus is my good shepherd. I can trust.